Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last session of the conference. I would like to introduce Professor Yao Wenzhen to moderate this session. Professor Zhen received her doctoral degree in epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health. She is a professor in health policy in our college and is active in both research and policy advocacy of promoting workers' health rights. With her expertise in this field, she will be hosting the session Healthy, work, uh, Healthy Workplace in an Aging Population, what it is and why it matters. Let's welcome Professor Yao Wenzhen. Thank you, uh, Wenzhen, for uh, your introduction. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this uh, the last session. Uh, the session is uh, Creating Healthy Environment. And I, um, on behalf of the College of uh, Public Health of NTU, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude again to our two uh, distinguished uh, speakers for being with us. Uh, let me uh, briefly introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, Professor Norido Kawakami. Uh, we have been a long-term friend. Uh, I remember I first uh, met uh, Professor Kawakami in 1999. At that time, I was still a postdoc research fellow at Harvard School of Public Health. And Norido has been well established at that time. And we met at a job stress conference. And uh, Norido has been always very kind to me to introduce uh, a lot of impo important uh, people in this field. So uh, he is a very special friend uh, to me and has been very helpful uh, in my uh, career development. And um, Professor Kawakami has published a lot internationally and also uh, domestically. And uh, to my understanding, he's also a, a leading figure in uh, job stress policy in Japan. And um, he's also uh, very active in international societies. Uh, to my understanding, he has been um, the chair of the ICO subcommittee, and he is currently the president of Japan uh, Society for, for Occupational Health. So I think uh, Professor uh, Kawakami is the perfect person to talk about um, how to promote health in the workplace in an aging society. So let's uh, give him a, a round of applause. Thank you very much, Yawen, um, for your very kind introduction. And uh, um, okay, so, thank you very much. Okay, maybe I should uh, put this. Um, the uh, friends and colleagues, uh, uh, first of all, I really thanks for your kind invitation uh, to this uh, very important conference. Um, the particularly uh, for the organizing committee, um, the Professor Weiji Chen and also the Dean. Chin, uh, sorry, with Chin and also the Dean Chen. Um, and also, the, uh, I, I would like to congratulate my con congratulator then to the, uh, um, the KP Chen uh, Preventive Medicine Foundation and uh, family members of the uh, KP Chen, uh, Professor KP Chen. Um, so I think that I, I have a lot, learned a lot today about the great achievement done by the uh, uh, Professor uh, K.B. Chen, and uh, I think uh, so the uh, public health professionals in Taiwan, you guys are very lucky to have uh, this kind of great leader uh, in the history of public health in Taiwan. So I think I bring back the, this story to Japan to tell, uh, tell my student <laughs> about this. Okay, so um, anyway, so the uh, uh, concerning my presentation, I, I picked up the healthy workplace in an aging population. Uh, this is a bit uh, um, challenging the topics to me, but uh, let me try to um, speak uh, some ideas I uh, get. Let me say this like this. Oh, okay. Um, so occupation health is a kind of the very broad field uh, that. Uh, focusing on the prevention of uh, all impairment uh, due to the work, including occupational diseases. And also, the, we, uh, occupational health is interested in pre pre protection and promotion of workers' health in general. And also, the we, occupational health is concerned about all aspects relating to the interaction between work and health. And uh, um, so, the WHO provided a more comprehensive framework called uh, work Healthy workplace model. In this uh, model, um, 
the um, the, the uh, WHO, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, work, oh, sorry, yeah. um, I, I bit, I'm a bit, not a bit, okay, so. Uh, the, this model um, in, uh, emphasized on the, the tackling with the uh, hazardous exposure, both uh, from physical work environment or psychological work environment, also the, uh, the model concerning the uh, increase in the personal health resources among workers, including healthy behaviors, and also the tackling with, so it's a bit hidden by, uh, uh, behind this, uh, um, but uh, the, also the concerning the uh, tackling with the, uh, the social determinants of worker health in general, so it's a kind of blow, give, give us a very broad overview, uh, broad framework uh, for the uh, healthy workplace. And the WHO says uh, it considers workplace health programs as uh, one of the best buy options for prevention and control of non-communicable disease and for mental health. Uh, having said that, so we also face the quick uh, aging um, in our societies. Uh, um, as uh, many researchers already um, mentioned today, um, the Japan is uh, Japan. Uh, the, the aging is uh, uh, still going on. Um, the, uh, the, and the, but uh, the other countries are also um, well chasing uh, our trend, and particularly the, among the Asian countries like the Korea and China and the Taiwan and other Asian countries, the speed of aging uh, is uh, will be much higher than. Uh, other countries, so that's a big problem. And also, the, uh, in addition to the uh, quick aging, uh, what we are facing is a shrinking population in the country. Um, uh, also, also, also the, uh, they are already discussed that we have smaller number of children, and uh, uh, the, uh, we, we expect, the, uh, for instance, the, in Japan, um, we're gonna have the uh, smaller uh, number of uh, people in the working population uh, 50 years later, uh, which is uh, almost half of the, uh, uh, its peak. So that's uh, really, um, and, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, it should be. And uh, these uh, um, declining birth rate and the uh, aging population uh, really um, causing the social and economic problem in the country. Um, like the uh, uh, sinking work population uh, may have the negative impact of economic growth, and also the uh, shrinking uh, population in the municipal uh, might uh, uh, might uh, cause the kind of dispersion of the municipal. And uh, some municipalities may have to diminish because of losing the uh, population, and the social security faces uh, an intergenerational imbalance, and uh, there are the big three. To to its sustainability. So the government has uh, tried to tackle with these problems uh, by several ways. Among these, um, the extending the retirement age uh, from 60 to 65 or maybe up to 70 is one strategy. And uh, uh, although the, uh, the many studies uh, show that the retirement is uh, Good for our health. Uh, topic, topic of my today talk, today talk is the uh, what is the healthy workplace model in the context of rapidly aging society and uh, why it is needed. But uh, uh, because of limited time and uh, uh, this is a bit challenging to topic, and uh, so I only pick up three possible challenges uh, uh, related to this uh, um, well, agenda. Sorry. Uh, first, um, the, it is well expected that the prevalence of uh, chronic conditions uh, uh, increased uh, as uh, people get in older. Um, this is the uh, data from Japan, um, the, um, the, uh, the showing the proportion of those who receive the medical treatment uh, for any reason and for the specific reason. Uh, you see the, uh, um, the uh, for instance, if you are over 60, um, uh, almost, 
more than half of the population received any medical treatment. So these are majority, and uh, those who did not receive the medical treatment are already minority. So if uh, the, we extend the retirement age uh, to the 65 or 70, so it uh, well expected that the prevalence of the chronic condition would be increased in the working population. And, uh, the particularly the uh, hypertension and uh, diabetes and also lo lower pain would be a major uh, problem in uh, uh, old, old uh, aging uh, working population. Uh, also, the uh, dementia might be a new uh, emerging occupational health problems in uh, aging society, um, which is already a uh, big uh, um, health conditions uh, targeted by the community health. Uh, according to the WHO report, um, they estimated the uh, um, number of new cases of dementia per year by age group and uh, regions of the world. And uh, um, they estimated the, um, for about, we could have the uh, uh, 400,000 um, new cases of dementia, sorry, sorry, um, dementia um, in the, from the age group uh, between the 60 and 64, 64 and also the uh, 500,000 um, um, new cases of dementia in the age group 65 to 69, if, if, even if we limited the, the age year only. So um, the dementia um, would be a kind of the uh, next uh, target of the occupational health, which is currently not. Uh, not only the increasing prevalence of or uh, incidence of dementia uh, in the working population, dementia might be a work-related disease. So several studies shows the um, the uh, uh, work, work uh, psychosocial work environment uh, might be a, might be a, um, a risk factor of dementia. For instance, the um, job strain. Uh, was reported as a risk factor of dementia in one study, and also the long working hours uh, was associated with the decrease in cognitive abilities, also the low organized justice uh, associated with the low cognitive abilities uh, from the uh, um, White House two um, cohort of studies. So the, uh, probably uh, um, we need to think about the uh, um, improving the psychosocial work environment to um, prevent the dementia uh, in the working population in the future as the uh, um, as working uh, um, population is aging. Also, the, um, um, the, 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 I think we expect the uh, uh, increasing uh, prevalence of uh, chronic condition in the working population, as I mentioned earlier. Um, for instance, the uh, um, cancer is uh, now the kind of chronic condition. So the, uh, there are many people survive uh, from the cancer, and uh, that's uh, already an issue in uh, Japan um, in occupation health settings. So uh, this is the estimation of the uh, uh, number of cancer cases uh, in the company. For instance, you are, if you are working in a, a company with the 100 employees, um, so it's well expected that the, you could have the four, about four cancer cases within uh, 10 years. If you're working in a company with the 1,000 employers, uh, you could have the, about 40 uh, cancer, new cancer cases within uh, 10 years. So it's, uh, that means that, really, um, that the, we could have the many, many workers uh, working the, um, Receiving the, I mean, receiving, receiving the treatment uh, for chronic conditions. I think the, something, this is something that we need to think uh, in the future in the aging society. So, the, summarizing the, these uh, several uh, slides, uh, I would uh, like to propose the challenge number one is the we need more prevention effort uh, in the occupational health setting as the population is aging. Uh, more, more effort for the prevention of clinical disease are required, and also the dementia might be a, a new target for the prevention and control, and uh, also the more control and the support for treatment of chronic conditions are required at the plaque place. Okay, so let me go on to the second part. Um, 
Probably uh, the, uh, many of you are very familiar with the uh, um, life course approach, which is often um, well discussed uh, in the context of social determinants of health. Uh, this uh, figure was uh, developed by my group, um, illustrating the, uh, how the social determinants affect the, uh, um, in a life force uh, approach perspective. Uh, this, uh, this is a very complex <laughs> um, figure, but uh, basically the, um, the social economic position in adulthood um, um, may, may, may uh, affect the health of the people through the medi mediators and the moderators. But the uh, most important point here is uh, social equity position in adulthood and these mediators uh, could um, affect the uh, health in the later life in the old age. So, um, so the, uh, there are several studies uh, done uh, to clarify the occupational exposure uh, impact on the health after retirement. Uh, psychosocial work environment uh, is already known to uh, affect the uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and the mental health after retirement. And also the carrying heavy materials are associated with the uh, physical disability after, among the people after retirement. And also the noise was associated with the uh, a greater uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease after retirement, and uh, also the uh, some uh, exposure to the uh, chemicals uh, also associated with the uh, um, functional disability after retirement. So, so let me con con conclude on the, uh, conclude the, the based on this uh, um, slide. Uh, I would propose the challenge number two is the. Uh, we need to consider the impact of work on health after the retirement. Uh, occupational health determinants of health after retirement should be considered in a preventive effort, which uh, we uh, uh, never thought about this previously. Um, the poor psychosocial and the physical work environment, and uh, also I did not mention about the health-related behavior, but uh, um, health-related behaviors formed during their working age uh, could affect the people's health after retirement. So this uh, um, leads to the, uh, an idea that uh, we could consider investing into the health promotion during the working age, expecting the return in healthy aging. But the tricky thing here is who invests and who gets the return? <laughs> Um, but clearly, the, uh, the company need to invest the health promotion, and the community could have a benefit. So I think we need to connect these two different uh, uh, sectors to do this. Okay, so let me go on to the uh, third uh, item. Um, so the, uh, I would like to repose that the, uh, there are increasing caregiving burden among the workers in Japan. Uh, the government level says the, uh, or about the uh, 24 million workers, that was the 4% of the total employees uh, um, engaged in the care living to, to, to their families in Japan. Uh, more sickly, uh, yeah. And they, when we uh, break down the, uh, these uh, workers by the age group, um, you see the not only the old workers, but the younger workers uh, also engaged in the, the uh, caregiving to the families. And uh, as the society uh, getting older, the, the, the uh, number of the workers engaged in the caregiving could be uh, increased. So we need to think about in, in these things in uh, occupational health settings. Also, the government uh, reported that uh, about the um, 100,000 employees per year quit their job due to caregiving in Japan. So, uh, also not only the caregiving burden, but also the company may lose the uh, workforce due to the employees' uh, caregiving. So, so that this is uh, really the um, threat uh, to the um, by challenging the situation to the companies. Okay, so the, to support the worker care living to families in occupational settings, um, there are several discussions. For, the, for instance, the government uh, 
um, discuss that uh, workers should be informed, oh, sorry, workers should be informed a community-based service to support the care being of the elderly uh, since uh, the, uh, often the um, workers uh, do not know about the uh, community health service. Um, also, the employers and the managers should consider the providing support for employees, <laughs> a caregiving for their families to let, and to let the employees continue their job. And also, government needs to establish the compensation for temporary leave due to the caregiving. So, uh, we need to probably um, um, uh, uh, develop the, uh, these uh, um, challenges uh, um, to, to meet the challenges uh, arising from the increasing cabin burden among workers. So the summarizing the, these uh, slides, and uh, then I would like to suppose the, that challenge number three is uh, we need to consider for the caregiving burden among workers, so more workers uh, are uh, expected to face a burden of care given their families in the aging society. And the CC work environment uh, should provide a flexible work style to help workers cope with uh, care giving. So that's the, probably one very important uh, feature of the healthy work environment concept. And uh, developing a new policy and program by the government and the company organization uh, connecting the community health service with occupation health uh, uh, service may be a key in this uh, case. Okay, so the, I come to the conclusion, and uh, um, of course uh, we, our occupational health uh, faces uh, many, many other challenges. Uh, but uh, um, if we uh, consider on the, uh, the, uh, these three challenges, these challenges demand the public health uh, to further develop the healthy workplace model in the aging society, and uh, that this uh, model should be expanded, uh, the healthy workplace model should be expanded to uh, tackle with the both old and uh, emerging dementia uh, health problems and uh, consider the impact of work on the health after retirement and uh, also the help workers cope with the care giving. Um, I think a more close sector effort is required, uh, for instance, between the community health and occupation health services, that one, one thing, and also the uh, um, Probably we need to expand the social responsibility concept for company organization uh, to invest the first promotion among the, during the working age to, 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 to promote the healthy aging of the community. So that's a kind of expanded the social corporate responsibility idea. But thank you very much. That's all from me. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Kawakami, for this talk. And you might have uh, some questions, but uh, we will save, uh, save them uh, during the uh, QA session. So thank you. Now I'd like to uh, invite our second uh, speaker, um, Professor Cha from uh, uh, National University of Singapore. Um, Professor Cha, um, is a founding dean of the um, uh, School, of, School of Public Health of National uh, University of Singapore. And uh, he's a physician by training and with a specialty in occupational health. And um, his research focuses on um, how genetic and lifestyle factors interact to cause chronic uh, diseases. Let's uh, welcome him. Can I have the slides? Now go back to the first slide. Okay, anyway, thank you to, uh, especially to my two friends, your previous dean and your current dean for the invitation to um, speak at this um, conference. Um, in fact, it's a very well organized uh, conference and from the discussion as well as from the video of watching the live of um, um, we, 
the, it resonates very well with what we are trying to achieve within the School of Public Health, the whole discussions today. Um, that uh, within our own School of Public Health, what we have been trying to do is to be able to turn discovery into healthier communities. In others, the focus on translation, the focus on making a practical impact in the society and in communities. And just by looking at the uh, life of uh, Professor Chen and the discussion that we had uh, this morning um, and this afternoon, it kind of um, fits very well together. And I'm just going to have this uh, last uh, presentation on the uh, health promotion in an aging society. And um, we have um, all heard today how the world is aging. And in particular, the aging problem in Asia, that Asia is aging very rapidly. And I think um, we have been having um, unwritten um, competition between Japan, Taiwan, and now Singapore as to who is the more rapidly aging population in our society. The truth is, we are all bad. We are all in trouble. Uh, because all our three societies are aging extremely rapidly. We have seen a lot of all these uh, population uh, pyramids. This was when I was born, in 1957. The population pyramid of Singapore was ideal. It is a pyramid. And as I age, the population aged with me, our BMI increased, our shape changed, and so did our population change. But actually, aging would not be a problem if there was corresponding increase or at least sustained total fertility rate. If our fertility has continued to increase or continue to be high, we would not have an aging population problem. The classic example actually is my family. My mother has 10 children. I am number 10. <laughs> she gave birth to me when she was 40 years old. <laughs> one generation, I have only one child. Right? So the transformation in society was very, very rapid. You know, and in Singapore, everything gets compressed. Yeah. And um, within one generation, the fertility rate plunged. And we have never succeeded in bringing it back up, no matter what kind of policy, what kind of incentives that the government has tried. What happens in 2050? In 2050, this will be Singapore. The population pyramid will be completely inverted. And the frightening thing is, I might still be alive. And therefore, I have a vested interest to deal with this aging problem in Singapore population because I may be one of those you know, who may benefit from whatever policies that we put in place now. Not only is there a demographic transition in Singapore, there's been also a political transition to a certain extent. Not so much in terms of change of government, but a change in mindset. In my 60 years of living, I went through 12 general elections. General elections in Singapore is the most boring thing you can ever find worse than studying for statistics or epidemiology. <laughs> Nothing ever happens in every single general election. The same party wins again and again. Nobody stays up at night to watch the results until 2011. In 2011, we saw this kind of crowds at opposition rallies. Right? Huge numbers turning up at opposition rallies because there was a whole group of younger people, younger adults, 
who now came to the um, voting age. And there was a tremendous change in terms of um, what the population wanted. And essentially, at this stage, the population was saying, we want to be heard. We want our immediate needs, we want the immediate challenges that we are facing to be addressed. Following the election results, well, the ruling party still won, but they conducted massive focus groups. It was called the Singapore Conversation. And essentially, across the whole country, there were many, many focus groups that were conducted to try and identify what are the issues that the population, that the citizens were worried about. And as you can see, healthcare across all uh, income groups, healthcare was a major, major concern. Healthcare is a political issue, right? And we in public health have to recognize that healthcare is a political issue, and how do we sometimes take advantage and sometimes be sensitive to the political undertones? Following that, in 2012, to address these immediate concerns, they came up with a Healthcare 2020 vision. That Healthcare 2020 is about accessibility, about affordability, about quality. So these were addressing the immediate issues that the population was facing. It was good, it was a good move, it was a, a right move forward, but there are still a lot of long-term challenges. And what we're very glad is this year, at the um, budget debate of the government, the Minister for Health came up with something that is, yes, we are addressing these issues, but we got to go beyond these issues. And he highlighted what is called the tree beyond, that our healthcare transformation must continue to take place to address these issues. It must be beyond hospital to community. It must be beyond quality to value. And it was music to my ears when the minister says, it must go beyond healthcare to health. So in other words, moving away from the traditional hospital-based kind of uh, uh, treatment uh, services to extend to primary healthcare, to extend to community partners, going beyond just quality, and there's a lot of innovations, there's precision medicine, personalized medicine, you know, and so forth. Newer is not necessarily better. You know, does it actually add value? Does it actually add quality? And of course, beyond healthcare to health, shifting the focus from treatment to prevention. So while there was a lot of focus on the meeting to the current needs of the population, current cries of the population, what I was very glad was that they could see beyond the current needs, that you need to focus on what we now commonly call as a tree beyond. Let me use an example of diabetes. Singapore has declared war on diabetes, and uh, our School of Public Health was the warmonger. We provided them data to say that, yes, we should focus, put a big focus on diabetes. Previous projection, 2010, we have about 350,000 diabetics. 2050, 460,000 diabetics. And, you know, the Ministry of Health says, well, it's a big problem, but not that big. It's manageable. We're managing 350,000, yeah, 460,000, fine. And we basically did our own projection and said, no, you have under-projected. 
we are going to have one million diabetics in a population, in a resident population of about four to five million. So 20% of the population are going to be diabetic in 2050. And the message that we were trying to get across was that the past projection was just based on aging population. Diabetes is not just an aging problem. And if you take the other factors in, you are going to end up with one million diabetics. Implication, yes, we need to increase the capacity of our healthcare system, but we also need to go upstream and slow down that increase. If we don't do that, we're kidding ourselves. The natural reaction for policymakers, the natural reaction for clinicians is that, yes, we must build more clinics, yes, we must build more hospitals, yes, we must activate the primary health care. Great, you must do all that. But you must do more than that. It is like you have a basin that is with a tap running and is overflowing with water. Your basin is your current healthcare system. Your water is your prevalence of diabetes that you have. The tap is running, that's your incidence. You increase your healthcare system, you have changed your basin into a bathtub. And then you look at your bathtub and say, ah, it is not quite full. And you pat yourself on the back and say that, yes, we have tackled the problem. But you forgot that the tap was still running and probably running at a higher rate. Sooner or later, your bathtub is going to overflow. Well, it's such a big issue now that even at our National Day Rally just in August this year, the National Day Rally is uh, once a year the Prime Minister will basically come and highlight what are the issues the country should confront. Most of the time it's boring things like, oh, our economy is not doing very well, you know, work harder. This year, it was interesting, he said, we need to look at longer term issues that are important to the success and well-being of Singapore. And diabetes was highlighted at his National Day rally as one of the three issues that we should be highlighting in Singapore. So this war on diabetes, essentially, from the biomedical perspective, very simple, prevent, screen, control of diabetes, right? But what is more interesting is the three enablers in terms of public education, stakeholder engagement, and data and research. It is very typical of what we do in Singapore, uh, taking a whole of government approach, taking a whole of society approach. And here I think it also highlights what our ministers of, for health talk about the three beyonds. And he's basically using diabetes as the poster boy to try and drive out the three beyonds. Like I said, the diabetes challenge in Singapore is not just an aging issue. We know the biggest risk factor, apart from aging, is obesity. But if you look at obesity in Singapore, you walk down Orchard Road, our shopping street, and if you see anyone who is obese, it's not a Singaporean. He's a tourist, a foreign tourist, or a foreign talent in Singapore. We Asians never, never look obese. We look very good. Most of my Caucasian friends, whenever they come to Singapore, they say, oh, you Asians look fantastic. And that's the problem, because we actually have a stereotype of what obesity is all about. And by definition, obesity is also BMI of 30. 
If you look at BMI of 30, not too bad. But Asian obesity is actually 27. Chinese, 27.5. Malay is about 27. Indian, 26. And at, BM, and at those BMI, you actually look good. Because all the fat is intra-abdominal. We hide it inside our abdomen. The Caucasians have it in their abdominal wall. They don't look good. But we Chinese in particular, we hide everything very well, even our obesity. So Asians are obese. We just hide it well. And when we were highlighting the problem of obesity and diabetes, a lot of the politicians and, um, and um, other policymakers were asking, why not a war on obesity? Why a war on diabetes? And we insisted that it has to be a war on diabetes because, you know, we just cannot visualize Asian obesity. If we go out and say that we want to have a war on obesity, the population just cannot visualize what is obesity. So we are fat, even though we don't look fat. Worse still, the problem of being overweight of obesity is actually in the younger population. It's not in the older population. This is the rate of increase of being overweight and obese within about 15 to 20 years. And among the young, it has gone up by almost two to threefold. More so in the males, less so in the females. Females probably, they want to look better. You know, males just couldn't be bothered. But more importantly for males, one of the hypotheses is actually our military service, our compulsory military service, may have contributed as an unintended consequence to obesity among young adults, overweight and obesity among young adults. The reason being, they have a lot of physical activity during the two years. They burn a lot. They also eat a lot. When I was doing my military service, every morning you have your exercise and your breakfast. After that, you will go out for exercise again. You have your tea break, exercise, lunch break, afternoon tea, and you have night exercise, you will have night snack one and night snack two. Right? It's perfectly fine because you are burning loads, you know, 2,000 over to 3,000 calories per day. Right? So it's perfectly fine to load yourself and have so many meals. But the day you leave the military, the mindset is, I have suffered for the last two years. I am not going to exercise anymore. Physical activity plunged down to zero, but I've been conditioned to eat for the last two years. I will continue to want to have night snack one and night snack two. Right? So it's similar to the professional sportsmen. The moment they retire, they just balloon out. It's exactly the same kind of phenomenon. And we think that that might have contributed. And now the military is uh, trying to have a rehabilitation process. Rehabilitate you back to society. You know, in the last uh, three months of your military service, they will st uh, start feeding you less, and they will tell you to continue to exercise more even when you get back to society and not to use any swear words and so forth. So it highlights, this problem highlights the importance of actually health promotion in the workplace, that um, the employers have to recognize that they need to build good habits in terms of health promotion and provide a health promoting environment in order to ensure that the productivity of the workers continue to rise. Right? And it also highlights the crucial transition between schooling, between military, into working life. 
So the first point I want to make this afternoon is that to tackle the aging problem, we must not be distracted by just targeting the elderly. Yes, we must target the elderly, but we must not be just targeting the elderly. To be ahead of the curve, we need to focus on today's young. They are tomorrow's elderly. Right? So to be ahead of the curve, we must focus on today's young. Second point, to cater for the old, we should be working towards health promotion to delay frailty, health promotion that promotes resilience. We all know, biologically, we will decline. Everything will go downhill. You know? The bad news is that after 20, after 30, everything goes downhill. The only thing that goes up is your risk of chronic disease. Right? This is, in a sense, a well-known well biological fact. Perhaps new way of thinking may change that. But in the immediate future, we are still locked in into this. Well, being a medical doctor, I tend to be more bio, biological or biomedically uh, focused. And when I look at diseases, the major focus was on biological determinants. It's only when I went to public health that I began to realize that actually the social determinants are much better, uh, are much more important, especially when you come to being diseased about the disease that you're having, that the social determinants play a much bigger role. But perhaps we should move away from being diseased about disease. We should move towards being at ease with disease. It's a biological fact. You know, I'm just waiting for the day to get my diabetes, waiting for the day to get my hypertension, waiting for the day to get my stroke, my ischemic heart disease, my cancer. It's a biological fact that I will get it, right? The probability of getting it is much higher than winning a lottery. Right? How can I be at ease, actually, with disease? Social determinants are going to be a big role. There are probably other determinants and I would suggest that by delaying frailty, by promoting resilience, we can help our population to become at ease with disease. Well, in Singapore, we have a program called Aging in Place. Um, I'm not sure whether they had the same concept of trying to build towards being at ease, but is keeping seniors healthy, active, and safe, and then providing access to quality and affordable health care. And there are several uh, initiatives to try to achieve that. You know? And so this is a program that they call Aging in Place. Final point I'd like to make is that to be able to deliver impact in this whole aging issue, we, take, we need to take a comprehensive approach to effect change in our value system in this area of health promotion. We all know very well about um, the KAP model for health promotion, that with knowledge it leads to the right attitude, leads to the right practice. So we want to increase health literacy. Many times we find that it doesn't lead to the right practice. So the administrators will come down and put key performance indicators. We want how many percent of people to be active, how many percent uh, your prevalence rate of uh, smoking to decrease and so forth. And believing that all this will work. Newer approaches, we now have nudges and you have created a health-promoting ecosystem. You bring in behavioral sciences, behavioral economics. And again, we believe that 
this will work. But if you believe in this KAP model, one glaring area that we have actually neglected is actually our attitudes. That we have focus on providing knowledge, we have focus on making sure that people do the right thing, but we have not actually worked on a person's attitude. We have not changed the person's attitude. Perhaps that's the reason why things have not been sustainable. Perhaps that's the reason why even behavioral economics brings about results that are generally quite superficial. And I'd like to suggest that to translate from knowledge to attitude, it is about the value system, the value system that we need to encourage in our population. We need to look at the relationship between practice and attitude. We always heard from change management consultants that it is easier to steer a moving car. So it's fine if the person is doing the right thing for the wrong reason, just do it. Right? With time, the right attitude will emerge. But without focusing on the right attitude at the same time or without evaluating whether the practice actually leads to the right attitude, it is like driving a car with your handbrake on. Lots of sound, lots of smoke, but very little forward action. And then I think we need to look into this area of how does nudges actually reinforce values or even nudges actually work against our values. A lot of behavioral economics uh, program uses uh, take advantage of our basal instincts in that sense, you know, our gambling instinct, our instinct to be ahead of everyone else to try to bring about the right behavior. Will those measures actually cause the wrong values to be reinforced? Will those nudges actually cause us to take, want to take more risk? And then we actually end up with risky health behaviors. So one of the value systems that we think we want to try to promote is to be able to value health as much as wealth. Currently, whether we like it or not, we are actually valuing wealth more than health. What's the real reason for sending my son to school, to 20 years of education? Because I want him to get a good degree, get a good job, they have learned all the skills necessary to create wealth in the future. So that by the time I retire, he can take care of me. Right? So a lot of times we are actually focusing on wealth. And in working life, we pursue wealth often at the expense of health. And when we retire, we are actually in ill health and frailty in spite of all the wealth. Well, very soon, our life expectancy in Singapore will probably hit 90. We are now 86 for female, 84 for males. I won't be surprised within the next decade or so, you'll be 90. And if our life expectancy is going to hit 90, maybe it's useful to think in terms of 30 years that the first 30 years of life is actually about building, developing habits and skills to create both wealth and health. And can we see the first 10 years of working life? Can employers see the first 10 years of working life to be not only building skills to create wealth, but also building skills to create health. And then, the next 30 years of working life 
is actually creating both wealth and health together. So that finally, hopefully, we will have the resilience in both wealth and health to be able to enjoy both. So the idea now that we are trying to promote and to push forward is to value health as much as wealth. We are making use of the war on diabetes to push this out. We are making use of another the program called Total Workplace Safety and Health, where we try to integrate both workplace safety and health promotion together rather than separately to be able to push um, this whole message of valuing health as much as health. So just a quick summary is that to be ahead of the curve, we must be focusing on today's young. To cater for today's old, health promotion to delay frailty, health promotion to promote resilience, and then to de deliver impact, to change the value system, to value health as much as we value wealth. Thank you. Thank you. So now we would like to invite Williams. Yeah. Now we would like to invite our school, a college dean, Professor Zhan Changchen, to present the gifts to the two speakers. Now let's start the uh, discussion session. So uh, let's welcome uh, three discussants. So uh, first discussant is Professor Chen Xiuqi. Uh, he is the Associate Dean of the School of Public Health of NTU and is also a professor in uh, preventive medicine and epidemiology. Please, please be seated. Okay. The second uh, discussant uh, is uh, Professor uh, Wang Yu Lo from uh, University of Malaya. And Professor Law is currently a visiting professor at uh, uh, Taipei Medical University. So please be seated. Okay. Uh, the third uh, discussion is uh, Dr. Zin from Minister of Health of Malaysia. So please uh, go to the stage. So I will invite our first discussion of Professor Chen Xiuqi to, uh, to uh, make comments to the previous the two, two speakers. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, Professor uh, <coughs> Chen uh, to chair this section. I think I learned a so lot about, about this section is uh, the notori actually uh, make a very uh, far-reaching speech on uh, how to uh, build up the healthcare model for the working uh, populations. For me, I think this is a really uh, very impressive because uh, he's talking about how the disease burden of uh, of uh, <coughs> of a disease in a Age in the working population change. For example, the dementia is one of the example you mentioned several times. <laughs> and uh, also, he brought up a very important uh, question about a uh, after retirement, how did you care about this old generation? And uh, also uh, about caregivers. And uh, for me, I think. This is something like we are talking about a uh, uh, long time ago about health investment. 
if you uh, think about this, you see this speech is quite perspective actually, uh, because Japan is always very famous of uh, taking care of uh, uh, working population from the since you uh, enter into these occupations, as as far as we know that. So this is a very, uh, very, very, uh, I think, important uh, concept uh, in Asian country. When you have a uh, uh, aging population is spent. And I share with Egypt, uh, with uh, experience for all the speakers, actually, Taiwan is even uh, have a such a problem because we have a baby boom uh, generations between, between the year of birth. Uh, 1946 to 1961. I'm the last uh, uh, generation of the uh, birth cohort of this birth cohort, and because of baby burn, they work very hard in the uh, when they <coughs> when they when they were in the working popu uh, population age, but because they suddenly uh, retire from the work, so that caused a lot of problem actually not only in the uh, the disease burden but also the financial uh, support from national health insurance. That's why. That's why I always uh, comment to com government, our financial support from healthcare viewpoint or baby boom is always not sufficient to cover this aging population. And today, his speech tells us, if you cover caregiver burden also, it's even worse. So this is very important. In terms of economic, develop, uh, economic viewpoint, we also call this is indirect cost. So uh, I think this is, uh, uh, this is one of the uh, one of the things we have to think about, because if you add up this in, in the red cost into the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the calculation, you see that intervention models even you know, become uh, very, very uh, uh, intriguing, intriguing. So I, I think this is my, <laughs> uh, uh, my uh, first uh, comment. The second comment, uh, you are absolutely correct about cross-sectional uh, uh, between community and occupations. I've been doing the screening for 25 years in this island and also with the country, in Western countries. I always think when I was doing the in, uh, integrate screening in a community, I never forget how to integrate the occupational group. So we have done actually for screening for occupation, but how to integrate you know, occupational uh, uh, a, a, a disease prevention into the communities. This is a great challenge. So I share the Michelle, uh, uh, the speech this morning as well. I think this is one of the example to talking about the social connectedness, you know, between the the uh, community and the occupation. So if uh, if if you if if we uh, pay attention to this, I think we have a think about how to develop an integrated framework, not only. In uh, one uh, one uh, one one research, pe research people or one uh, <coughs> one health authority working on the uh, community and one health authority and professor working on the occupation. There is always you know separation without any uh, integration. So this is again is great. It's very really great. Great uh, the thinking you know and uh, also. So this is uh, two comment uh, to <laughs> and respond to your. Excellent, you know, very perspective re uh, speech. The second, I think, the second uh, speech from uh, the Sanki, I think, I, I always talking about life course, uh, life course. I think it's absolutely correct. Again, we talking about integrate the multiple education program in the community, just exactly the same as you have proposed. Because when you take care of the elderly people, you have to rely on the young generation and how to. How to understand the intergeneration concept between uh, these uh, peoples is so important, and uh, so I, I share I, I share your idea about lab course, of course, and I just I just want to add one comment about why the young generation is always become uh, obsessed. You give a very good story about military service. I share you because the young generation. Uh, after exercise or they, they stop exercise, they're not even eating that, but they, they, just, they just play the mobile so often, so they forget the exercise because they play mobile, you know, during, uh, in, the, in the midnight, and the, you, you know, if you have experience in, in the walking on the midnight, you see, if you're hungry, so you want to eat a lot, and everyone knows this is very dangerous and detrimental to health. That's why 
we have to think about the IT after IT behavior. I just chatting with uh, uh, Dr. Chen uh, Chen, Chen Mei uh, He's also she's also expert in this area. So we think about you know this. So that's why I share with this. You know. So so that's a lot uh, to uh, uh, to urge ours to think about uh, how to. Uh, <laughs> To, to develop, develop a, a, a very good integration model uh, for, for life course. I think I have a, 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 a major comment uh, about two, uh, the, the two speakers, and I enjoy, uh, so enjoying about uh, these uh, uh, two speeches. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Professor Chen, for the comment. So he said that the younger people like to play mobile and forget eating, so we may have some comments from the audience later on. Okay. It is my food. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now uh, let's welcome the second discussion of Professor Law to uh, make some uh, comments. Right. Excellent. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Right. Um, it's mainly comments and observation, not so much a question. Uh, I think right from the very beginning, early in the morning, you have heard right until now, uh, there are several observations that we can make, you know, from all the speakers. Number one is the aging population is increasing, no doubt. Secondly is, as we age, not only we accumulate knowledge and wisdom, but the diseases we are accumulating along the way, as shown you know, by Professor Chai's uh, lecture as well, all the chronic diseases, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's also increasing. And thirdly is, healthcare costs you know, is also increasing because government is pumping money you know, as, far, uh, uh, as far as, you know, uh, cost is concerned as far as financing social benefit programs, you know, in helping, uh, you know, our elderly. And finally, you know, we also hear that there is also uh, a huge disparity, uh, intergenerational gap between the young and old and health disparity among, you know, all the uh, uh, older people. And therefore, this boils down on, you know, policies we are making uh, as to what kind of strategies, you know, that we can actually help, uh, you know, the aging population. One of them is perhaps uh, the whole question on retirement scheme. Um, during those days, uh, when I was in the UK, I was trained in the UK. You know, I see my lecturers all coming in when they are, you know, uh, during retirement. They retire gradually. <coughs> Unlike in Malaysia, the minute you are 58. That's it. Tomorrow you don't turn up from work. Uh, you, you don't turn up to work. You know. So that kind of uh, you know all of a sudden you know that you don't have a job, and that actually affects you know a person's self self worth and the psychological well being of a person. You know, you may be a person. You may be a director of a hospital. You may be a CEO of a company. And all of a sudden, the next day, you know, you don't even know how to dial the number of your friend, you know, the number of, you know, your wife, because every so often, it's the secretary who dial all the number for you, yeah? And, and then you find yourself, you know, very restless, very useless, and the self-worth is definitely affected. So perhaps, I think, in certain countries, uh, such as in Malaysia, the kind of gradual retirement scheme, I think, should be, you know, uh, embedded. Uh, should be, you know, perhaps slowly developed, not, you know, all of a sudden. Because in other Western countries, you see that, you know, uh, people who are about to retire, say, for instance, in a month, in three months' time, in, a, in six months or in a year, what they do is instead of coming to work five days, they come to work four days a week, then subsequently three days a week, two days a week, one day a week. So that the impact of retirement, you know, is not so sudden because that can cause a lot of psychological stress you know, on people who are at that level of, uh, you know, upon retirement. So that is one thing to think about. And I think the other strategy that we can also use is, uh, which I think has covered in Professor Kawakami's uh, lecture as well, it's uh, not just giving them any Tom, Dick and Harry job, a job that is actually meaningful uh, uh, to the older people, you know, a job, you know, that they can relate to rather than just throwing them a job or I think they need a job, okay, fine, just give them a job. But what does the job mean to them? I think, you know, that kind, you know, of, of a meaning attached to the job given to the older people means a lot and can have a positive impact on the psychological well-being, you know, of the aged people. So here again, you know, it is not 
any kind of job, but a job that is meaningful, that all a person can relate to, and happily you know, carry out the task uh, that is entrusted to them. And I think the other issue that we need to address is uh, to be able to recognize you know, a job, you know, uh, sometimes it may be a paid job, fine, very good, you know, you're increasing the financial uh, uh, status you know, of the elderly, and what happens if it's an unpaid job? Because the minute you retire, some, or I would think that most of older population, older person, engage in voluntary work. Now, in certain society, those voluntary work, those artistic work, creative work, or whatever you call it, you know, it's not being recognized. It's not being rewarded. It's not being given any incentive to. So unless and until we recognize, you know, uh, unpaid jobs such as voluntary jobs, because most of them actually turn to voluntary jobs, and give them a sense of dignity, a sense of choice, of freedom, you know, and autonomy, you know, in whatever they are doing. And this, of course, will help them increase their social well-being and the psychological well-being as well. Now, back to the SDGs that we are, you know, dealing with, trying to achieve, particularly explicitly SDG number three, it's to be very inclusive of all ages, yeah? And that includes, you know, the aged people. And I think for us to achieve that, for company to achieve that, particularly as far as occupational health is concerned, it's the whole concept of ageism. And I don't think any of the speaker has actually mentioned that. Now, in certain society, for example, I can actually tell you honestly, even in Malaysia, how does people look at older people when it comes to job? You'll be the first one to go when there's a, you know, a company is going bust, you know, or bankruptcy, you know, the older people would be the first one to go, yeah? So here again, I think the negative attitude uh, related to older people as far as job is concerned, occupation is concerned, and the whole negative stereotyping of older people. Unless and until we change the mindset of companies, of society towards older people, then we can talk about sustainability of older people in the workplace so as to maintain uh, a good quality of life and to instill the social values and the psychological well-being of these uh, uh, older people. Okay, thank you, Professor Law, for your comments. Now let's turn to uh, the third uh, discussion. Professor Ding. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am actually very delighted to be here. Uh, such an excellent conference. Um, um, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor uh, Chia and also Professor Norito for a very, um, I, I shall say, very inspiring and very an eye-opening presentation, of which uh, I think the, 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 the key points of whatever that we are talking from the morning is actually the attitude about aging population. So uh, what I would like to say about one thing about the organization, organizational behavior towards age <coughs> workers is actually the concerns on the mental health. You know, uh, as we all know that when we are in the office, we always say that, oh, perhaps she's already old. That's why she is slow. So then after that, that kind of statement made them more depressed and made them, you know, feel uh, low, lower from the other workers. And that those kind of things that actually provoke them to, to, to be happy with the diseases of which they can be uh, absent from work because of follow-up appointment with doctors and all that. So these kind of things, these kind of remarks, I think we should address in our, our uh, organizational, uh, especially in terms of occupational health. So uh, that area in particular, I, I would really love that the public health is actually addressing that. Um, and another thing about the attitude, as we all know now, we are actually living online. Basically, we are living online. We've been checking our phone, not just the younger generation, including my mom, including my dad. Uh, they, they has been looking towards the phone, where are my daughters, WhatsApp, 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 you know? So it's like we are living online, and we have to accept that. You can't deny the rampant changes in technology. 
You just can't ignore the handphone. You can't ignore emails anymore. It's no more the, the years of we are actually waiting for letters, waiting for postcards. It's no more. It's gone. That yes, it's gone. So we have to move on. So this attitude now, yeah, if you look into it back again, the nature of how we were born is no more there. So our job now is actually to nurture the nature. So basically, whatever nature that we have, we should be taking care of the elderly, we should respect the elderly, is, is more or less not there anymore. Or even if it exists, it's basically because of the value of the family. So at this point of time, as a public health uh, physician, uh, or as a, as a people who are actually working in the community, we really need to nurture back our population, our people that uh, the elderly are actually the, the one that we should care for because when we invest for the, me as a policymaker, when we invest uh, our policies on this generation at the moment, one day we are the one who are using it. So whatever that we know best, uh, going to be best for the elderly population now, and that will be what we will be using in the future. So, so I guess uh, this attitude is, is really something that we really need to look into and we really need to focus on because as we all know, knowledge is already there. Uh, the practices is already there. But now the, 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 the license of driving, like you said, Professor Chia, that, that one, we have to set up the criteria for that. So uh, I guess um, it's not an easy job for us. But, but it's going to be a challenge, but as we all know, challenge is going to be an opportunity for us to make improvement. Uh, in terms of, uh, even in terms of this attitude, I feel that uh, the area of safety for the elderly should be looking into in depth, because uh, safety for elderly is not just in the hospital, but also in the population, in the community, even at home, even at workplace. So I guess uh, collaboration between either agencies, uh, inter-ministry should be there. There should be some platform for every country, this is in my opinion, uh, whereby we actually collaborate with each other and make a proper planning for, for the future elderly generation. So I guess these are my comments and I, I would like to hear from Prof Chia and Prof Naruto comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, can I have uh, Professor uh, Kawakami to uh, make some brief response to? Okay, the thank you very much. Um, the uh, is very variable comment and the questions. Um, maybe first uh, the uh, the issue raised by the Dr. Chen. Um, the uh, I. So I, I thank you very much for pointing out that the importance of the um, cooperation between. Uh, community and the uh, workplace. Um, so during the, actually, the, I, I, during my pre preparation of this presentation, I get really aware of that the, that's a key issue in, uh, um, in, in uh, occupational health in uh, aging society. And uh, um, there, there may be several possibilities. Well, well, okay, basically the uh, company, uh, uh, well, we quite uh, seek the profit, not the contribution to the community. So there's a the kind of big gap between the community and the uh, company. But uh, uh, for instance, the larger company, when they are going to set up the big factory in one area of the country, where the uh, um, company need to be responsible for taking care of the whole community. So there might be a, they might be have the kind of contract uh, uh, with the community to contribute to the uh, healthy aging in that community. So that these uh, type uh, might be uh, um, uh, alternative um, ways. And the also the, uh, for the small car companies, uh, if, we, if the community itself uh, called upon the participation uh, of the, the smaller workplaces in uh, um, the, in the contribution to the, the healthy aging in the community. So that might work if the community lead the, that activity. So there are several possibilities. I'm sure these are really feasible, but uh, these are just 
there, there, might, there are some ideas for that. And also, the, uh, I, thank you very much. I, I think uh, I really appreciate that you pick up the, the cost issue, so calculating the indirect cost. During lunchtime, uh, we had a small conversation with Michelle and uh, yeah, when that uh, we are not very good at calculating the uh, cost related to health in the past, but uh, now we need to speak uh, such a kind of language uh, with the uh, um, eco possible economic impact uh, on the health and the healthcare. So I think that's uh, um, something that we need to do in the future. And uh, closely related to with the Dr. Jin's um, comments on the uh, um, so probably changing organizers' behavior to set up the healthy work environment for. Um, support the uh, workers and also the uh, contributing to the community. So um, let, let me. Uh, this is not still not a, in the ongoing, but uh, so let me introduce the uh, what we are uh, experiencing in Japan. So the, under the strong leadership by the Prime Minister Abe, uh, we uh, we are currently experience the uh, work style reform policy. So in that uh, policy, so the government requires the company to um, shorten the working hours and uh, uh, give the workers more flexibility um, um, to balance between uh, work and the life or work and the treatment for uh, chronic conditions. Um, um, I think the, uh, the if it, if this, is, if this is successful, I think um, this might be a good uh, um, good practice for the other countries too. Um, but uh, I'm not sure still um, the, uh, this is uh, really successful or not. So we need to um, carefully monitor the progress. And uh, to the uh, comment from the Professor Low, um, so it's a wonderful idea the, that uh, we could have the kind of gradual retirement, um, the uh, not 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 the immediate retirement, but the, 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 so this. Uh, so I think uh, the in many of the uh, um, Japanese companies uh, they have the kind of system so that the uh, first uh, first they can choose the uh, um, the five day um, no, sorry that that the uh, that part. Um, maybe the three day per week uh, employment and then gradually shorten the, the working days. But the problem is the uh, um, our system um, only provides a benefit for the those who worked at least half of the week. So if you uh, work shorter than that, that you would not get any benefit from the work. So I think that's a, that's a system problem. So we, we need to think about the um, improvement of the system itself. And uh, also the, um, so I think I, I really agree with the, uh, so um, in, usually we had a kind of a stereotype view on uh, the, uh, the uh, elderly. So, but, uh, Elder is uh, not homogeneous. So some people want to continue to work, and some wa people want to uh, retire and uh, um, live their own life. So I think uh, we need to be more flexible and uh, wear careful view on the uh, elderly. So thank you very much. That's from me. And uh, I think the uh, Professor the, the, the you are also the expert in occupational health. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have uh, some additional comment. <laughs> <laughs> Do the conversation, please. I'm but, uh, a jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> uh, maybe let me make uh, two points. Uh, the first one, uh, I'll try and bring together some of the points about uh, the digital world, the, the media, the online world, and values. Um, so, yeah, we are living in an online world, but actually this online world is going to change very quickly. Um, is going to change into a virtual reality world, augmented reality world, it's going to change into an AI world. Right? And all these are going to change very, very fast. I don't think I'll be dead by the time I see uh, AI uh, companion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and this is supposed to make life enjoyable, make uh, work easier. The question I have and the challenge I, I put to you and to myself is, 
can we make use of this to create values? Can we make use of all this new technology to create values? We have been making use of this to impart knowledge, right? I mean, online courses, online uh, information, on-demand information, at the right time information. We, we have only been using it to provide the knowledge. We have been using it to um, provide the nudges. We have been using it to monitor our KPIs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we haven't made use of it to create value, create the right value, create the right attitude. Maybe with this technology we can. One example is um, there's uh, this little tool. You key in all your you know, lifestyle habits, you put in all your biomedical um, parameters, your BMI. And then it shows you your face. The output is your face. And it says, this is your face. But your real face is something else. Right? That means it shows you age, for example. Because of all this lifestyle that you are taking, because of all this uh, BMI and so forth, your true biological age is actually this. You actually look like this, right? Um, so, so in a sense, I mean, that's a little gimmick, a little uh, tool, but I think it does actually help in terms of uh, trying to build the right values. Yeah? Um, you know, but there, there, there are so few of such examples, and, and I think one challenge is how do we work with people in this, in the uh, AI world, people in computing and so forth, to actually let's come up with something that can build our internal values. Then the second point I'd like to make is um, this whole thing about uh, health promotion in the workplace. Um, one big hurdle that we will all face is that um, Occupational health and occupational safety is actually in another government ministry. Right? Health promotion is in Ministry of Health. Occupational health, industrial safety is usually in manpower or Ministry of Industry and so forth. And um, like all government ministries you know, all over the world, they just don't talk to each other. Right? <laughs> No, that's not true. They do talk to each other. They do talk to a lot to each other, but a lot of turf issues, a lot of politics. And I think one challenge is actually can MPH students have one of the core competency or core subject be political science, right? And, and I think having an appreciation, not so much of political system, but rather political interactions uh, across government ministries and, and, and so forth, uh, actually helps a lot. Actually helps a lot. If not, you, you, you end up um, you know, banging your head against the wall. If not, you end up being cynical. I mean, it's perfectly to be fine to be critical, but unfortunately, all these kind of uh, things that bugs us, drives us, and makes us cynical. And then I think it's against the, the, the very purpose that, that we want to accomplish. So perhaps um, yeah, uh, a course or a module in pol uh, political science, inter intergovernmental agency uh, work, yeah, um, it will be, will be something very useful. Thank you for the comments. So it uh, echoed uh, the comments uh, in this morning from, from uh, Dean Williams that we have to learn how to work uh, with people in different disciplines and we have to uh, try to build uh, interdisciplined uh, collaboration. And we have to learn how to uh, uh, convince people with different values. So value is an important thing that we should address. And now we have a few minutes uh, left, so I'd like to invite uh, um, the audience to raise questions if you have any. Uh, maybe we should turn on the light. Okay. 
So, uh, is there any question from the audience? I can't see you. Okay, Yang Mei. <laughs> I actually um, I'm curious about what kind of strategies our experience that Japan has applied in terms of encouraging company to hire elders and to provide flexible working hours to keep those caregivers in the workforce. So whether you have any experience that you can share with us. Thank you. Oh, professor. We, uh, um, th there, there, there are several kind of historical things, but uh, um, in the short, uh, uh, that's a really political <laughs> um, the matter. I think uh, the government uh, directly talked to the uh, representative of the c companies to, to accept the uh, <laughs> uh, new policy and the new programs, and the, 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 the company representatives accepted that. So then uh, now, <laughs> Every company uh, required to do. It's not a mandatory, but uh, that's kind of the based on the company, uh, I mean, employer, government relationship. So that's uh, so that's the uh, really um, pushing the Japanese company to hire the more elderly and also diminish the work hours and also the um, try to provide the more flexible working style to the workers. So that's a really political um, movement. <laughs> Um, other questions from the audience? You want to add a bit more? Okay, follow up. Um, sure. So what's the retirement age for Japan's company right now? Right now, I think uh, that's set up 65, uh, but uh, it will be extended to the 70 <laughs> very soon. <laughs> okay. uh, I'd like to ask uh, Tinja, because in your talk, you have a very uh, creative thinking because you uh, divide the whole life course uh, into different stages and you try to emphasize uh, not only to create or pursue uh, wealth, but also uh, to pursue uh, health. So uh, would you like to elaborate? For example, during a uh, 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 young age, how you you are going to major, they already learn or create a house. And, and also uh, somehow to persuade uh, the boss or the government that you know, health is as important as wealth. Any, uh, I, but I, I know you have a lot of ideas, so like to elaborate? <laughs> So I think um, the, the, the good thing about Singapore is at least I don't think I need uh, to convince uh, the political office holders that much in terms of uh, the importance of health. You know? um, there is that uh, recognition. Um, but of course, um, they love to work with numbers. So um, give them numbers. Right? Um, so, for example, they like one million. So, so you're going to have one million diabetics. <laughs> uh, they like one billion. You know? so, so we said that um, uh, in the year 2010, in Singapore, there were only 180,000 diabetics in the working population. But these 180,000 um, uh, diabetics in the working population cost Singapore economy one billion dollars. Right? So I think giving, giving evidence, giving numbers um, uh, helps. Um, number for numbers. Numbers for numbers and, and, and uh, speaking their language. Right? Same thing with employers, speaking their language. They, they are talking about bottom line. That's the honest truth, right? And um, don't judge them. You know, uh, if, if I were in their shoes, I would have done exactly the same thing, right? Um, but using their language, using their lingo, um, they are talking about productivity, they are talking about bringing costs down. Right? Um, so, so using those, and I think more importantly, using um, examples, concrete life examples. Um, so, so in giving um, talks to employers, for example, uh, I love one illustration that I always give is a diabetic 
who um, had a, a nail stuck in his uh, sole of his feet, but because he has peripheral neuropathy, he just doesn't feel a thing. You know, he's been walking around, and then we end up having to amputate him. And, and those kind of stories help them to visualize, you know, because in the first place, what is diabetes? And what's diabetes among my workers, you know? But giving them stories and, and finding that. So, so I think um, we academics need to communicate in a different way, number one. Okay? Uh, and we academics have to find newer ways. Okay? Um, secondly, I think engaging the people who are actually the recipients. So say, for example, in education, when we go and talk to our education ministry to say, hey, you know, because of this war on diabetes, you must uh, include diabetes in the, your curriculum. They will turn around and say, my timetable, my curriculum is just so full. Don't, you want one more module on health education of di on diabetes? Yeah. Um, but that's what a lot of times the, the administrator and the knee-jerk reaction is. Okay? Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is, can we get a few retired teachers and basically pose them this question? You, know, you have primary school, secondary school, colleges. Can you, using existing uh, curriculum, just put in examples of diabetes? So one of them came up, for example, uh, in mathematics, in, in, in arithmetic, you know. Uh, one can of Coke has nine teaspoonfuls of sugar. Tom drank five cans. How much sugar did he consume? Right? So you are doing arithmetic, but the subliminal message is Coca-Cola has lots of sugar. <laughs> right? So, so, in a sense, that is actually health education, uh, but done in a very subtle, subliminal way, you know, and, and so forth. So, so I think um, this didn't come from me. This come from, from people who, who um, were going to do the teaching, you know, and, and so forth. So, I, I think engaging the community and engaging the wider group, um, you, you, you get much, much more ideas. Okay. Thank you for uh, all these discussions, and I think I, um, people will agree with them and agree with us that uh, public health education should incorporate such kind of uh, discussion, communication, and uh, public uh, the engagement with the community. So uh, I have learned a lot, and I hope that you agree with me. So let's uh, give them a, a warm applause. Thank you.